The accounts payable process is more complex than many accounting and finance professionals realize. It's far more than just receiving and paying bills. That's exactly why I created this intensive session. This is the second part of a series with the first part having been viewed by over 40,000 professionals in the first 10 months for accounts payable content that's pretty amazing. If you're an experienced accounting or an accounts payable for professional looking to refresh your knowledge, a recent graduate aiming to break into accounts payable, or a seasoned finance expert seeking to enhance your skills, you've come to the right place. Stay with us until the end when we dive into the key issues that many organizations struggle with, causing significant headaches. Missing out on this could mean missing critical insights that could streamline your accounts payable process and enhance your financial operation. Don't click away. You can't afford to do that. Hey guys, I'm Mary Schaefer. For the last 25 years, I've spent my time eating, drinking, sleeping, accounts payable, and related issues. I've shared what I've learned in over 20 published books, most still available from online booksellers, thousands of magazine and newsletter articles, over 600 videos for this channel, and thousands of webinars and conference talks for both educational institutions and service providers. But enough about me. Let's dive right in to the fundamentals of accounts payable part two. So real quickly, we're going to talk about today the basics, and then we're going to move on, and I'm going to show you some things that you can do that will demonstrate that you're an above average employee, uh, somebody who should be promoted um, and then should be given a good raise. Uh, then we're going to dive into what I call ruthless tactics. And I call them ruthless not for the usual reason that you think about uh, somebody being ruthless, but because I want you to be ruthless in the pursuit of these goals. And then lastly, we're going to uh, spend a little bit of time talking about practices that if you're using them, and sadly many organizations are using them, it will create losses for your, your organization. And I'm talking about financial losses. So there's something that uh, we, we probably all want to avoid if we can at all, at all possible. Okay, so let's, you know, talk about accounts payable. Like the best rest of the business community and the rest of the accounts payable space, it is evolving. It's becoming more efficient, of course, thanks to technology. And we still are focused on driving down costs. I don't think that's ever going to go away. And we want to create an operation that's fraud resistant, which is easier said than done these days because uh, crooks also are taking advantage of technology. And so um, it's, it's, it's an interesting uh, situation, if you will. Probably most of us would like it to be a little less interesting, if you will. Uh, now, as I mentioned, we're, talking, we're going to talk about the fundamentals. Um, I have two books that you might be interested in, but that's all I'm going to say about them. I'm not going to uh, carry on about it. So as promised, we're going to start with the basics. Now, when we talk about the basics, when we talk about accounts payable, what I'm really focusing on here to start with is separation of duties, appropriate separation of duties. This means that in order for your organization to experience an internal fraud anyway, you'd have to have two employees collude and appropriate separation of duties makes that a little bit more difficult because anytime collusion is necessary, um, it increases the or decreases the likelihood that you'll experience a fraud. Now, this might seem pretty obvious and you may be sitting out there listening to me going, yeah, of course, but um, what it means is that this is getting more difficult because our accounts payable departments, like every, many other functions, are getting smaller and smaller as we take advantage of some of the efficiencies that are brought our way uh, for, uh, by technology. But there are some solutions. Sometimes you'll move a particular function out of the accounts payable department into another area within the accounting function so that um, you'll have the appropriate separation of duties. Sometimes you'll uh, include compensating um, activities so that there'll be some checking uh, because you did not have the appropriate separation of duties. Not an ideal situation, but this is an issue that we used to always think about as a small company issue. That is not the case anymore. It's something that we all are have to deal with, or not maybe not all of us, maybe like really big companies don't have this problem, but most mid-sized companies were going to find themselves facing this. Now, I want to talk about uh, emails and in, in, in 
invoices, specifically in invoices. You want to set up a separate address, a separate email address where invoices should be sent to. And they should be sent to only to this address. And it, it should be something like invoices at ABC Company or accounts payable or AP, whatever you want it to be. And then all invoices should be sent there. Your suppliers should be told not to send invoices anyplace else, but just to this one email address. And they should be only sending one copy. Um, I, I call it stop the deluge, if you will, because many organizations are finding themselves inundated with numerous copies of the same invoice. And unfortunately, that, that takes a lot of extra work just to process and, you know, weed out those duplicates. And sometimes those duplicates, they slip through and they get paid a second time. And that is, you know, not a good situation. But even if they don't, it takes a certain amount of work to weed out those duplicates. And you want your people to be working on something that's more value-add than uh, something like this. When it comes to our invoices, we want to uh, set up what I call a coding standard. Um, and this rigidly spells out exactly how data should be entered. And you want to spell out everything. You don't want to leave it to anybody thinking, ah, eh, everybody knows this because I can guarantee you'll have a few people who don't. Now, sometimes people will say, but you know what? We've purchased an automation solution. Um, do we really have to do this? Do we really have to stick to it? And my, my answer is yes, for several reasons. Even if you've purchased an automation solution, um, almost nobody has been successful in getting 100% of their invoices processed through the automation solution. So there's still some uh, manual data entry going on as much as we wish that wasn't. So you'll have that issue. And you'll also have the issue is sometimes you're, you'll have discrepant invoices. In fact, you'll almost always have some discrepant invoices. And this means your employees are going to have to go in. They're going to have to make some changes. And when they do, you don't want them to be introducing another error because of the way they entered the data. So this is just one more uh, example of how really you have to be very controlled in accounts payable because as I like to say, accounts payable is in the details and if you get the details wrong, you pay too much and you know that is not a good thing. Now let's talk a little bit also about the master vendor file. When we talk about the master vendor file, this should be a separate function because remember we started off talking about appropriate separation of duties and part of that appropriate separation of duties is having a separate person responsible for entering data in the master vendor file be it about a new vendor or updating information about existing vendors now in quite a few organizations I don't want to say many because that might be overstating it it might not be but anyway uh, you'll have your invoice processes actually doing the updating of the master vendor file um, that negates your appropriate separation of duties completely and it also opens the door for the possibility of getting things wrong and it opens the door for getting vendors in the master vendor file um, many times more than once um, etc so um, the takeaway on this particular uh, point is that there should be someone who does master vendor file and that should not be uh, somebody who is processing your invoices so if you are one of those entities you might want to revisit it and see what you could do to uh, fix that. The next thing that I want to talk about is verifications. Now, at the same time, we're, we're always trying to become more efficient and more effective. And at the same time, as we're getting all this new technology, which hopefully will streamline our operations, make us more efficient, and maybe we'll, you know, even be able to uh, have one or two less people in the accounts payable function, or at least that's what management may be thinking and hoping. At the same time, we have that going on. We have all these new frauds that are coming at us at the speed of light. Many of them are coming in the form of emails. And the, the two most prominent ones, at least prominent right now, and by no means are these the only ones, are emails from criminals who are trying to pass themselves off as one of your existing vendors. And they will say something like, can you please change the bank my, our bank account where you're making our payments? This is if you're making ACH payments. Um, we've had to close our account and open a new account. Now, when you get those those emails, many times they're, they're completely legit, legitimate. But unfortunately, occasionally they're not legitimate. And if you make that change and you send the money to the criminal, then you're still on the hook for that money. I don't think you want to be. 
So there's that, and then there's the wires that look like they came from the CFO asking you to do a rush wire transfer. Those are the two main ones. They must be verified. And unfortunately, to do that verification, oftentimes you have to pick up the phone and track that person down. And that takes quite a bit of time. So, you know, we're getting the technology. We're trying to be more efficient. We're trying to be able to process more transactions. But then we're now adding back this very, very manual step of doing these verifications. But unfortunately, you have to do them. There's no way around it. You can call a hundred times, a hundred times. It's yes, this was correct. Yes, that was email did come from us. And then the hundred and first time you don't call. It wasn't from the this the supplier. You end up sending money someplace where you shouldn't, and then you can't get the money back. Now I've just talked about change of bank account and rush wire transfers from the CFO, but actually any time you get instructions to do something that is out of the ordinary way that you normally do something, then you need to verify and. You know, criminals are pretty slick. They know that um, they'll try and do it at a time that you're busy. They know you're busy, like, for example, in accounts payable at the end of the month. Uh, they'll try and do it when it's difficult for you to get a hold of the person. So, that, you know, they have managed to discern, for example, that your CFO is going to uh, be giving a talk and then maybe he or she is the keynote speaker at a big conference, then they'll be trying to send these when you know you, the person's up on stage and you absolutely you know can't get hold of them. So just put that in the back of your mind. Anytime they're, they're hurry, 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 or um, don't talk to anybody, this is a secret, that should be red flags that something might be out of the ordinary. Now, the next point that I wanna make about, or talk about is doing what I call a periodic review. And this is more for your managers who Basically, you have your policy and procedures manual, hopefully, and what they want to do is sit with each of your processes, each of the person on your staff. If we're talking about accounts payable, we're mainly talking about invoice processes, but also the, whoever's making your payments, uh, the person responsible for the master vendor file, etc. And you want to make sure that they are using the routines that you have spelled out. So they're using that rigid coding standard that we talked about um, earlier, and they're also following the policy policies and, and the procedures more that, that you have outlined in your uh, policy and procedures manual. They should not be taking shortcuts. If they are taking a shortcut, then you want to evaluate it. Um, if it is truly a shortcut and doesn't create problems elsewhere, then everybody should be using it. You want to incorporate that into your um, existing policies and procedures. And But oftentimes what will happen is, yes, it makes their job easier, but it creates a problem for someone else. So you have to ask them to stop doing that. And these reviews, they don't have to be long. You can sit with somebody for half an hour, an hour, whatever's necessary to see that they're doing their work the way they're supposed to be. But they should be on a surprise basis so that people don't have a chance to prepare if you will, um, ahead of time. Okay, those are some of the basics that, you know, if you work in accounts payable that you should be looking at. And now I want to talk about a few things that, a few tactics, if you will, or strategies that will demonstrate that you are an above average employee, somebody that you should, uh, that, that really should be, has management potential. So the first thing I want to talk about is discrepant invoices and tracking discrepant invoices. Discrepant invoices, as you can probably figure out with those invoices that there's a discrepancy. So when it comes into accounts payable and they, they start to do the three-way match to try and figure out, you know, to the ver verify that the invoice is accurate and correct, um, there is a discrepancy. Maybe the price is off, maybe the, the, the quantity, whatever it is, there's discrepancy. And so somebody has to call the, the purchaser, and that's usually the invoice processor, and determine uh, what is the, you know, get it corrected, you know, fixed. But when this uh, these invoices are discrepant, you know, they tend to be put aside. And let's face it, it's not everybody's favorite uh, task. So you want to make sure that somebody, and this is usually the accounts payable manager, but it doesn't have to be that person. It can be a supervisor. It can be whoever um, is tracking all this discrepant invoices and then making sure they're following up and making sure that people get these things resolved, that they don't sit on this discrepancy list month after month, okay? Because that's when a second and a third invoice gets sent and somehow they, they manage to get paid sometimes more than once. Many ERP systems will have uh, software built in or functionality built in that you can you, you 
can use for tracking these uh, discrepant invoices, but if they don't, you can do it in an Excel file. So you want to make sure that you track them, that you follow up, and ideally you want to do this before the due date so the invoice can be paid on time because as you hopefully are well aware, if it's not paid on time, the vendor is going to send a second, another copy of that invoice, creating more work for you. And as much as I'd like to say, you know, they, they shouldn't do that, I can't, okay, because if you haven't paid them on time, they are well within their rights to do whatever they need to do in order to get paid on time. So I've already alluded to the fact that um, criminals are taking advantage, if you will, of uh, the technology, and we are continually having to face new frauds. That, that's just a sad fact of life in the business world today. Now, when you hear of a new fraud, I like to tell people, you know, you want to be the town prior. You want to tell everybody about it because sometimes not falling for a new fraud, it's simply a matter of knowing that there, this fraud is going on. And when, they, when you know about it, then you'll recognize recognize it. But if somebody hasn't pointed it out to you, it's like a typo. When, you know, you don't see it when you first look, but once it's pointed out to you, it kind of jumps out. So you want to, as soon as you hear about a new fraud, you want to share it with all your colleagues. Then if you're the manager, you want to share it up and down, share it with everyone who works for you, uh, management, and, and some of your colleagues, if you have them at, uh, at other companies. So not only broadcast the news that this is going on, however it is, but also if there's a solution, you want to broadcast cast that. And you want to do this as soon as you hear. This is one of those things, you know, that it might be nice if you could wait till the end of the month when you have your staff luncheon and then alert everybody. But sadly, if that's two weeks down the road, that's two weeks where your people have the opportunity, not that this is a great opportunity, to fall for the fraud. So as soon as you hear it, hear what it, whatever it is that's going on, share it. And I like to tell people, hey, if you can, if you remember, tell me and I can share it with the community. But, you know, this is one of those times, be the big mouth who's, you know, blabbering about it. Now, I want to talk about W-9s, um, you know, and, and I know they, they, they tend to be a little bit of a nightmare uh, because, you know, it, it's, it's just a lot of extra regulatory reporting work, but you, it doesn't have to be, okay? Those, getting those, those W-9s does not have to be a nightmare, nor do the 1099s. So you want to make sure you collect them from everyone um, and then you run the, that information through IRS TIN matching uh, to determine if there are any discrepancies. And there should be no exceptions. Just because a company tells you, hey, you don't have to worry, we're not reportable, you don't need a W-9 from us, don't take their word for it. Because if you are audited and it turns out you should have been issuing a 1099, your defense with the IRS, if you go and tell them, hey, they said they weren't reportable is going to not bear water, okay? You're still going to be uh, deemed responsible and possibly even uh, responsible for the taxes that were not paid. So just no exceptions. And in this day and age, honestly, there's no reason why somebody shouldn't automatically give you the W-9 when you ask for it. Most companies, people, they'll have a, the W-9 filled out, an electronic company, and they can just email it to you the moment you ask. Okay, next I want to talk about duplicate payments. The harsh truth is, and, and if you're a manager and you're listening to this, or if you're a controller or a CFO, understand that every organization occasionally makes a duplicate payment. Payment. To say that you never make a duplicate payment is like saying you never make a mistake. It would be nice, but the reality is um, we all make them. So everybody, except that everybody has a duplicate, makes a duplicate payment, just want to keep the number down as low as possible. And keep in mind also that vendors rarely re, uh, return them without you doing something, without you, you take making some effort. Now, it is true that some will issue a vendor credit, but the vendor credits, they have their own problems. You have to... A, make sure that they get sent to the right place, and then you have to make sure that your processes know how to process them. And that, that's two more places where the, the whole thing can f fall through the cracks. So what you want to do is check, double check, I like to say, and triple check, looking for duplicates to make sure, uh, ideally, that you don't make them. But if you do make those duplicate payments, then you want to recover them you know, as quickly as you can, but you, at least you want to get the money back. Many vendors are very good about issuing vendor credits, but but 
Uh, you have to be aware of them in order to take advantage of them. And all this is extra work. So as much as you can uh, find ways not to make them or to find them on your own, the better you'll be. Okay, now I'm going to talk about something that, to be honest, is not going to make you popular uh, when you try and advocate for this, but it will make your payment function more effective and more efficient, and it'll make your expense policy uh, more effective and more efficient. Okay, your company won't have to spend more money on it than now. And that is to mandate the use of a company credit card. Do not let employees use their own personal uh, credit cards for uh, travel and entertainment. Now, many times employees want to use their own company credit, uh, their own credit card because they want to get the points for something. But this creates a lot of extra work in accounts payable. Uh, reimbursing them and um, it also opens the door for a number of different types of fraud uh, games that employees can play which if you mandate the use of the company card all these games go away okay now the problem is is that the decision to allow employees to use their own card is typically not in made it's definitely not made by people who work in accounts payable rarely is it made by the accounts payable manager it's either made by the controller the CFO or some other high-level executive and oftentimes that those particular people they want to use their own credit cards also because they want to get the points or whatever and so you have to convince them that this is a bad idea uh, it creates a lot of extra work at a time when organizations are looking to streamline and become more efficient and as I said it opens the door for some types of frauds it won't make you popular when you advocate for this but it is the right thing to do now next point I want to talk about is having a policy policy and procedures manual. Now, sometimes people say, oh, that's just make work. Why do we need one? So let me ask you this. If everybody in your accounts payable department got together and they bought a lottery ticket and they won the Powerball or one of these other big drawings and the whole department quit, would you be able to get the bills paid and uh, payments issued so that supplies would keep uh, selling you stuff and giving you the raw materials you need to make products? Well, if you have an updated policy and procedures manual you well on your way to being able to keep keep the shop running otherwise you'll be in there blind trying to hire new people who won't have instructions won't know what to do so as much as that policy and procedures manual may seem like a lot of extra work um, you want to make sure you have one and you want to keep it updated because if it's not updated and it's several years out of date and you don't have your new practices in there whatever they are then you may as well not have it and if you let it go more than a few years it's even worse now here we come to the ruthless part or what I call the ruthless pursuit of excellence and let me explain what I mean by this so you first you want to ruthlessly eliminate weak practices now the accounts payable space and I'm sure other spaces as well but it's just I'm so familiar with the accounts payable space is rife with weak, what I call weak practices practices that require a lot of extra work and don't add any value so let me give you a few that I that we've already been talking about using personal credit cards for travel and entertainment and then reimbursing them along the same lines cash advances you want to eliminate all cash advances if you possibly can and if you're giving employees company credit cards you should be well along the road to doing that uh, returning checks to requisitioners not only is a weak practice it creates a lot of extra work uh, but it's also a weak internal control so if you have people who are trying to demand that you do this uh, you want to get internal audit and let them let them be the bad guys explaining why you're not going to do it and petty cash boxes it could talk for forever about petty cash boxes now I know most of you have gotten rid of them and only about 20 to 25 percent companies still have them but they are they're just a, a big time waster and they don't really add that much value or even any value today uh, given all the other options that are available you also want to ruthlessly weed out and eliminate as many paper checks as you can now I'd like to I like to say you know eliminate them all and that would be ideal but in the real world at least in the United States not in some other countries but in the United States we're not going to get there I will tell you there 
are a few countries in Europe that do not process checks at all anymore. You can't make payments that way. But we're not in the United we're in the United States. We're not in Europe, so we still have to deal with them. But we are making some really good progress uh, getting away from them. So as much as you can, you want to start encouraging your suppliers to accept electronic payments. And you know sometimes it's just simply a matter of asking them will they accept it and pointing out what the benefits are. Not the benefits for you. Okay, they can figure out that you've got some benefits if you're asking, but the benefits for them. Some other practices that I've seen companies doing that um, uh, facilitates this elimination or reduction of paper checks is they uh, establish a practice of only if they have to make a rush payment, it can only be made electronically. It will not be made with paper checks. The beauty of this is obviously you have one less paper check, but also sometimes once people get a, a one payment electronically, they see the benefit and then they're like, oh, you'll, you'll pay me like this all the time? And then you can say yes, and you do that. The next thing, and I've seen this more and more, is you make electronic payments, ACH, not only your preferred payment option, but you go forward assuming that somebody is going to uh, allow you to pay them electronically. So when you set up a new vendor, you send them your ACH form, your ACH enrollment form. Okay, so you just make it your preferred payment option. And, you, you know, people are more acceptable than they were in the past. Your next ruthless task, if you will, re relates around paper invoices. I think we can get rid of completely. I think we're, we're pretty good about eliminating paper invoices. What you want to do, I'm not saying get rid of invoices, although I know there are many of you who'd like to do this, but get rid of paper invoices. People can email them to you. That's all that, that's all that you're asking. And over 70% of invoices today are not sent uh, through the mail as, as a paper invoices, but they're sent electronically either through in, uh, email or through some automation solution. So ask again, point out the benefits. Uh, there's a lot of them. And we're already at over 70% of invoices being received this way. So I think, I, I do, I really believe that we will be able to get to the point where we can eliminate paper invoices. And by the way, when you get those, those, those electronic invoices in, don't print them out, okay? Process them without. Ideally, your processes will have two screens. I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, and then you, they can have the document opened on one and they can process on the other screen. Okay, I want to talk, I promised that we're going to talk about uh, eliminating practices that uh, will uh, that cause losses. But before we get to that, if you're finding value from this talk, um, I would appreciate it if you'd hit that like or that thumbs up button. It sends a message to both me and to the service provider that you find value in this and they should share this talk with more people. So the first thing that I want to talk about is the company credit card when an employee leaves. Now, most companies are pretty good about getting the company credit card back, but that's all they do. Now, that does not protect you completely. Yes, you've got the card back, but if the employee was a slick, they wrote down the credit card number, the expiration date, and that four or five digit code, and then they can go shopping online to their heart's content. What can you do to protect yourself about that? As soon as you know somebody is leaving and they're not going to um, need the card anymore, then what you should be doing is immediately calling the card issuer and canceling the card. That way, if they get online and they try and go shopping with it, the, ca the card will be declined because it is no longer a good card. So not only get the card back, but cancel with the issuer. In fact, you don't even have to get the card back if you're going to cancel with the issuer because if they try and use that uh, card, it, it won't work. Okay, next thing, uh, we see some companies, not a lot, but some companies will allow employees to put personal purchases on the company credit card. This creates a whole lot of extra work for your team who is monitoring those expense reports. It's non-value-added work, and it's something you won't want to do. Also consider this, that uh, when somebody has put something on the company credit card, if you, you terminate their employment, what chances do you think you have of them remembering to reimburse the, the company for those items? And no, you cannot take it out of their list, paycheck, or at least in most states can't. The next thing is to, to take in mind that this is a slippery slope. Um, sometimes people forget Forget, and they truly do forget that they use the company credit card and then they don't reimburse the company and if the person who's doing the monitoring doesn't find it then you know the company pays for it and sometimes they forget 
And by that I mean that they put it on, they really don't have any intention of paying for it themselves unless you find it. So all this is creating extra work and you don't need that extra work. Your, your team is already doing enough work and, then, and you want them to focus on value added work. Okay, I wanna talk about, we talked a little bit about separation of duties at the beginning, uh, but one of the things that we see happen over and over again, and you wanna advocate that this does not happen, is that an organization has the purpose perfect separation of duties, and then they have one exception. And the exception usually is the accounts payable manner or the controller, but not always. It can be somebody else. And inevitably, this is a long-term trusted employee, and people will say, oh, Joe's with, been with us forever. He, he would never steal from us, or Jane's been with us. In fact, you know, she never even takes vacation. That should be a red flag that maybe something is off because they're not taking vacation because there's an ongoing fraud. So no exceptions. A separation of duties across the board no matter how well respected uh, the employee is and no matter how much work extra work it, it, it creates. Now I want to talk about a little bit about remote work and technology. One of the things we hear from time to time is companies will say something like okay I don't really want my employees to work remotely but if they want to work one day or two days a week at home they can but they have to get their own technology. Not a good idea and you know when we're talking about the technology that people are using to do their jobs. We're not talking about big expenditures. We're, we're talking at most about a few thousand dollars. Do not insist that they use their own technology. In fact, I would go so far as to say I would not permit them to use their own technology. Why not? Well, for starters, it's not as fast, so they will not be as productive, or it's a chance it's not. It's probably not as secure as the uh, technology that you have put on all your laptops and computers in the office, so you want to make sure that you, there is the security. And then it's also that computer, if it's a, it's a family computer, um, will can be shared with others, with other family members, or if they're rooming with other people, if, you know, young people, sometimes two or three of them will share an apartment. So you don't know who is going to be using that device. So you want to give them, you know, a device. You want to make sure it has all the security on it, and you want to make it clear to them that it is for uh, company work, their, their work only, not to be shared with other people. Now, I want to talk a little bit about more technology um, issues. I already alluded to the fact that uh, if you work in accounts payable and a lot of other places, um, that they should have two screens, okay? Ideally, two screens uh, on each computer, it'll make them a lot more efficient. And the second screen doesn't, doesn't really cost that much, so it's not like you're talking about spending a lot of money. You wanna make sure that their remote access is secure, um, and also make sure, you know, there's automation, there's AI, all this is coming into the accounts payable function. Uh, it, it's a lot more than we used to have. And there's, so these are a lot of new things that it's critical that your people understand. And we want to, you want to make sure that they understand. So there's a lot of new information that they need about automation, about AI, and it's critical uh, that they understand. Um, so this, um, the, these issues um, of technology and AI are, are so important that we've done two uh, longer programs programs about them, um, which you can watch right now using the links that have appeared on your screen and are in the description. Good luck.